It is a, it's a privilege to introduce Auguste Sugianto, who I typically introduce as the emperor of all models at Wells Fargo and the god of all models at Bank of America because he, he, he built all the ways, mil, million ways of making sure models are both accurate, interpretable, but also ready for regulators and run amok in the, on, 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 on the financial markets out there. But Agus is steeped in, is, is an engineer, self-taught mathematician as he calls himself, steeped in the art of building models for financial markets and banks. And without further ado, I, I leave you in his great, great voice. Thank, thank you. you, thank you. Uh, thank you for the time. What, what I would like to share is our view and our journey on the interpretable uh, machine learning. In particular, I, I come from a uh, very heavily regulated industry that uh, model and risk, what model can go wrong has to be properly managed and also understanding what the model does is extremely, extremely critical. In, in our world, the uh, uh, non-interpretable model will not get approved, will not get into production. So machine learning model need, cannot be a black box. Machine learning model has to be as transparent, as interpre interpretable, as traditional statistical model. So that's what the, uh, the focus and the journey that we have. And we have been talking to H2O for quite some time. We used the H2O uh, first with the uh, GLM back in the uh, 2014, if I'm not mistaken. And then we have a lot of interaction. So I, I'm, I'm encouraged with the, uh, with the progress in H2O on the, uh, on the machine learning interpretability. I, I know uh, I'm familiar with a few people. I think uh, 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 a few talk as well. Patrick Hall will talk about MLI. So this is my, my, my view here that hopefully will complement that one as well. And this is our view about interpretable machine learning. Let's see if I can, okay. Uh, let me share a little bit first in terms of our journey and the rapid adoption in machine learning in various areas of banking. The first area is, of course, is area, the domain that traditionally the domain of statistical model. So credit risk, credit scoring, financial crime, fraud, those are the typical uh, domain that the, uh, in the past are the domain of more traditional uh, statistical model and people exploring and using machine learning to, to do that. The other area that's uh, rapidly coming to uh, adoption are really areas that previously not using model. This is area like compliance, conduct risk, customer assistance, a lot of NLP, uh, email monitoring to make sure uh, the uh, complaint monitoring. So it's a lot. Uh, uh, in, 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 in banking, we have to uh, uh, comply with regulation in terms of uh, uh, fair practice. So, so those are detected using uh, uh, monitor and uh, using machine learning to, to monitor those. So it's coming to an area that traditionally not using model now start becoming model, model intensive. And then an area that uh, traditionally uh, require intensive numerical computation. This is the capital market area, be it uh, uh, derivative pricing, sophisticated derivative pricing, solving high dimensional integral. For example, when we're doing basket option for, for equity, the, uh, the equity basket of 500 uh, stocks in it, that's a very, very high dimensional, a 500 dimension of uh, integ integration problem that it will be very difficult to solve using finite different equation. So people tend to, to simplify the model and solve the model. Now we can apply deep learning to do that, to, uh, to really solve the, uh, the, the complicated, very high dimensional uh, uh, integration problem to solve a uh, uh, derivative uh, pricing uh, using deep learning. So yeah, there are several papers that my team published uh, in, in, in archives. You can check probably two paper and uh, next week another paper will come up in terms of how to price a uh, barrier option. So it's very, very uh, coming very, very fast because of the, uh, of, 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 of the computation capability in various area. And in our world, this type of model is heavily regulated. 
by SR 11.7 and OCC 11-12. These are the Bible, are the, the rules, uh, the guidance that regulators have that we have to follow. So uh, that's, that's an area that, that that's lead to the next one, that we need to, to manage model risk in, in machine learning. So what do we worry about in machine learning? Then we need to pay attention a lot. So first is, of course, this is tool that is very data driven. So data bias, model bias are very, very critical. I'll give an example. Uh, there, there, there is tool that, that we use and many of banks use. When you make a phone call uh, asking for, uh, about your credit card about, or your online banking, your call is monitored. And that call is monitored by machine learning, looking at what call you're coming from, geolocation, what line do you use, what device do you use, and using also the voice biometrics, and then go to the machine learning and then identify whether the call is fraudulent or not, right? So train using that and making decision where uh, real time, the person who received the call, if you're asking, can you send my credit card, new credit card to this address instead of my home address, right? So apparently, when you do that, you check, oh, this is wonderful, it saves money, a lot of the detection and all those things, asking you to do, to do uh, 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 two authentication stuff so that it will make it safer. But it turns out that the model is biased for non-native English speaker. For Spanish speaker, the false positive will be higher. So when, when we start dealing with NLP, when we start dealing with non-traditional data, when somebody calling from your network that use is a boost network, and the people that call using boost network has higher false positive, it start worrying. Because you start doing your machine learning is discriminatory, right? Then all of a sudden protect this class citizen treated differently. So that is something that really, really dangerous in machine learning, everything you build, you have to check. Sometimes this is something that make me cringe, make me difficult sleep at night because somehow we will be in a Wall Street Journal or Maxine Water or Elizabeth Warren will go all over Wells Fargo, right? So this is something that I am worried a lot. Two is conceptual, conceptual soundness. Uh, conceptual soundness is very, very important that doesn't, uh, is not getting attention and also uh, the school, the education doesn't teach this. I am very encouraged that the, uh, uh, the uh, and uh, with, with, uh, with uh, uh, H2O spending quite, quite a bit on this. When I talk about conceptual soundness, a few things in there. Uh, uh, let, me, let me step back a little bit, conceptual soundness and data bias so before I go to the conceptual soundness on that. Conceptual soundness is about interpretability. Can we understand the model? Is the model make sense? So testing, you have cross-validation tests, you have testing, data splitting, is not sufficient. That, let, me, let me say this. Machine learning, let be it GBM, be it random forest, be it, uh, be it deep learning is highly non-parametric model, non-parametric statistics. It will fit anything. And in the machine learning, we typically throw in a lot of, uh, a lot of variables, right? They are correlated variables. For example, I put the amount of transaction, amount of transaction in one week, amount of transaction in two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, number of transaction, one week, two weeks, three weeks. Oh, those are correlated, right? And a lot of variables are correlated. Now, with correlated variable, Let's say, it's a, for example, it's a simple linear correlation. You train machine learning. This effect can flip-flopping. It can be highly nonlinear, flip-flopping. You test the output, it's still good. Your model doesn't make sense, right? So that's require interpretability, understanding what's under the hood of the model to really understand conceptual soundness. Why conceptual soundness is important? Because we know the model will do something wrong. The model will be wrong. You have, you have type one and type two error. You have confusion matrix. Some area that has very, very uh, little bit sparse data, it will go wrong. Your model may overfit. So how do you know? So uh, uh, without understanding the inside, 
interpretability of the model. We'll go to uh, more detail on this. Uh, it's, 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 it's really key. One thing is the connection between dieta bias and conceptual soundness. Since this is something that made me cringe as well in the financial institution. We are very late in the credit cycle. Credit problem, it will happen anytime. I will not predict whether two years or three years or one year, but it will come, right? Uh, consumer leverage is increasing. So yes, GDP can go, uh, GDP is going up, getting better, unemployment getting better. But if you recall in mid 90, the same thing happened, but the credit default also going up at that time. So when people building machine learning today for credit underwriting, make me cringe. Because your data is extremely biased, you train it with the last two years or whatever. People use alternative data. Today environment, everybody will pay their loan, will repay their loan. You don't need machine learning, you don't need no brainer to get a lift. Yeah? But uh, the, the, you get ROI, oh, increase ROI. The ROI in banking is not measured in one year or two years. The ROI in banking is when recession or credit cycle coming. You wipe out the entire 10 years, uh, more than 10 years things. Yeah? If you recall SSBC, when they went to subprime, it took them 10 years to clean up. Nobody willing to pay, uh, buy their, their, their portfolio. So data bias is also bias about time, time window. And is this the model sound? What variable do you use? Is the variable make sense? What is the strongest variable? And if you do credit model, the strongest variable is timeliness of paying their phone bill. So you should be questioning, right? So that's the, that's the type of things that we need to, to think about. Implementation is a very important because model will go wrong. Your uh, voice recognition will go to your uh, you got online banking, and you know how bad that our voice recognition are. And when, when Amazon sending, uh, Alexa sending a private message to somebody else, right? Very soon it will happen. Your online banking will send money to somebody else without, without what you want, right? So that's implementation control, understanding what can go wrong and how to detect that one. Change control. Very critical because you're going to refit, you're going to retrain your model. When you retrain your model, this is non-parametric model. The model will change completely. The factor will change. So how do you know that? How do you control that? So that's uh, the type of thing that would, would keep us awake. So I need to move faster. Uh, let me go deeper on the conceptual soundness and model interpretability. This is what uh, some of things that uh, we have connection, a lot of connection with uh, MLI and H2O and Patrick's and company have been talking to us a lot. So one of the things is input-output explainability. This is the thing that uh, Patrick Hall probably call it as post hoc, right? So you have a model, you have black box model, random forest or GBM, let's explain it. So input-output, you use PDP, you use ICE, you use SHARP, uh, or we are our version, uh, our version, we, we have the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, total derivative attribution to look at what's important of variable and then what is the nonlinearity, what are the interactions. So you see that plot over there, the, uh, the, the diagonal are really the, the main effect, the off, uh, off diagonal really the interaction of variables. So you can go deep uh, using some of the technique can be as transparent as statistical model to look at the effect plot, how the model work, what's it under the hood, does it make sense? So this is uh, uh, things that's very, very critical. Uh, post uh, with, with this tool, you can look at how to deal with correlated variable uh, so that we don't misinterpret it. So many, many of tools like PDP uh, not able to deal with correlated variables. So now we need tool in machine learning, we need tool that will be able to deal with the uh, correlated variable as well. I'm not going to talk about in detail on this one, but you can check the paper in archive or you can talk to a, a, a few people in, in, in this one as well. What I'm going to do, and it's the second one I'm going to just mention briefly is model distillation. Coming up with simplified model, I think it's 2 has the three structure. You put, uh, you put three uh, after you have your, your, your model, simple tree to understand the model. Lime is one of example of the uh, 
of the uh, modern distillation lo locally, I think is to all have K-lime. We have uh, another approach that's called uh, lime soup that will be coded in H2O as well. There's a paper that we wrote in Arca. But let me talk about structure interpretable model because we want to build model, sophisticated machine learning model that is interpretable from the ground up. Yeah? From the ground up will be interpretable. Can we do it? So a lot of things people talk about this, even DARPA have a research on this one, right? How to make explainable AI. That's what we're working as well, how to make the uh, from the ground up to be interpretable. That's what I'm going to share with you more in this one. This is uh, things that we call it XNN, explainable neural networks. I think as H2O is coding this, have a uh, uh, prototype uh, on, on XNN. Uh, the, the, if you're interested on, in this one here, you can look also the paper in archive. So what we have is here, neural network. Neural network, people think, is the most black box model. I would argue neural network is the most interpretable model if you, we, don't know, we know how to use it right, right? Let's think about this. Neural network, single layer first. Neural network, single layer, and use ReLU activation function. Think about one dimensional problem first, yeah? Think about one dimensional. What neural network does is piecewise linear spline. Exactly piecewise linear, uh, piecewise linear spline. The bias weight is not location. Yeah? Single, single layer neural network is spline machine. It's piecewise linear spline. No more than that. Uh, we call it very fancy with neuron, with activation function, with all those. Single layer neural network is piecewise linear, with ReLU activation function is piecewise linear spline. If we have multi-dimension, it's projection spline. Now, if we projection spline, if because we use very simple piecewise linear, you need a lot of them. Make it the model not interpretable. So what do we do? Let's control it. Make the activation function more sophisticated. If the activation function more sophisticated, we don't need that too many, too many unit because the activation function is sophisticated. So that's exactly what we do here. The first layer is projection layer. We project it. Once you project it, it becomes one dimensional. Yeah? Once one dimensional, then you can put whatever deep network you want as a sophisticated rich function. Yeah? Think of it. It's a simple network. The first one is summation, and then you put activation function that's complicated, right? Instead of putting activation that's complicated, I'm putting deep network because the machinery already there. So with that, we can control it. What do we control? Control the sparsity first. The sparsity is what? I am the, uh, the, the, the projection, the x1, x2, x whatever. Make it as sparse as possible. So only a few variables go to one, one sub-network. And then at the end, also put sparsity so that not too many, many sub-network, as minimum as possible sub-network. So that's sparsity. So with that sparsity, you can have extremely interpretable model because the variable is simple projection. You can look at it. The risk function, you can look at it. I'm uh, fast forward a little bit so you can see what is the projection, which variable are important, what is the rich function. So very, very clear, very, 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 very simple. So highly interpretable, you can see it, you can interpret it. Let me go back before I go forward. We can make it even more interpretable, if you would like to, put the orthogonality constraint. Orthogonality constraint, make the projection on the first layer right there, projection layer, make it orthogonal. And we know this one. This is called principal component, right? We do that all the time. Statisticians do principal component. We're just doing it principal component supervised because principal component is unsupervised. Principal component is not good for prediction. So you have to do projection orthogonal like principal component, but doing the best regression. So orthogonality. And then smoothness. Smoothness is the sub-network, that deep network, make it as smooth as possible. I am going to jump because I have uh, only 50 seconds here. Let me do 
an example, and you can read the paper very uh, the paper in, in in archive. One things that we took is an example using the data in uh, uh, in, in, in Kegel landing clubs, right? Because I, I this is for pu public uh, presentation, so I used to about pu public information. So you run this uh, this highly interpretable neural network, right? And compare it to other machine learning, so you can see random forest and and X and N is very, very close. But what's the, what's the insight that we have? That's the variable that's important. Among many variables, that's the, that's the important fa of variable. On, on the right-hand side, which variable important? So I have four sub-network. Yeah, I have four sub-network. And uh, so if, if you recall on, on, on this, I basically I have four pr projection. The projection, if you look at this, is all only single variable. With what this one tells us, the data landing club in Kegel, you can model it really well using generalized additive model. You don't need sophisticated model to model this. To be as good as random forest, you just need to build generalized additive model because it's only one variable. The rest is not very significant. So one variable, and then you do a nonlinear a nonlinear uh, rich function like shown on the left, you got it, okay? So this techniques, if you do it structure, it can, the model can be extremely interpretable. So I'm run out of time. So with that, I don't think any, any time for question and answer, right? No, so <laughs> my apology. <laughs>